it's going to get worse. The seasonal flu that we deal with every year has a mortality of 0.1%. The stated mortality overall of this, when you look at all the data, including China, is about 3%. It first started off as 2 and now 3 I think if you count all the cases of minimally symptomatic or asymptomatic infection, that probably brings the mortality rate down to somewhere around 1% which means it is 10 times more lethal than the seasonal flu. If we are complacent and don't do really aggressive containment and mitigation, the number could go way up and be involved in many, many millions. If we taught to contain, we could flatten it. We've got to change our behavior. We have to essentially assume that we are going to get hit. And that's why we talk about making mitigation and containment in a much more vigorous way. People ask, why would you want to make any mitigation? We don't have any cases. That's when you do it. We would hope that as we get to warmer weather, it would go down. What we see every year with influenza, as you get to March and April and May, it actually goes way down. And other non-novel coronavirus, but common cold coronaviruses often do that. So for someone to, to, to at least consider that that might happen, is reasonable but underlying but we do not know what this virus is going to do we would hope that as we get to warmer weather it would go down but we can't proceed under that assumption we've got to assume that it's going to get worse and worse and worse whenever you have an outbreak that you can start seeing community spread which means by definition that you don't know what the index case is and the way you can approach it is by contact tracing. When you have enough of that, then it becomes a situation where you're not gonna be able to effectively and efficiently contain it. Whenever you look at the history of outbreaks, what you see now in an uncontained way, and although we are containing it in some respects, we keep getting people coming in from the country that are travel related. We've seen that in many of the states that are now involved. And then when you get community spread, it makes the challenge much greater. So I can say we will see more cases and things will get worse than they are right now. How much worse we'll get will depend on our ability to do two things, to contain the influx of in people who are infected coming from the outside and the ability to contain and mitigate within our own country. Bottom line, it's going to get worse. If you have someone who has a reason to believe that they're infected, either that they have symptoms or they have come into contact with someone who is either travel related or who is in fact documented to have been infected or exposed, that's something where you go to a physician, you get a test and you find out if an individual is infected. The other that was discussed is a surveillance type where you're not looking to see if anybody's been exposed, but you want to find what the penetrance of this particular infection is. And that's a different thing than the physician-patient relationship. That's trying to get a feel for what's out there. To get an idea, forgetting the people who think they may be infected, who actually is infected. With regard to vaccines, we were able to very quickly go from an understanding of what this virus was to what the genetic sequence was to actually developing a vaccine. But there's a lot of confusion about developing a vaccine. In the next, I would say, four weeks or so, we will go into what is called a phase one clinical trial to determine if one of the candidates, and there are more than one candidate, there are probably at least 10 or so that are at various stages of development. The one that we've been talking about is one that involves a platform called messenger RNA, but it really serves as a prototype for other types of vaccines that are simultaneously being developed. Getting it into phase one in a matter of months is the quickest that anyone has ever done literally in the history of vaccinology. However, the process of developing a vaccine is one that is not that quick. So we go into phase one. It'll take about three months to determine if it's safe. That'll bring us three or four months down the pike. And then you go into an important phase called phase two to determine if it works. Since this is a vaccine 
You don't want to give it to normal, healthy people with the possibility that A, it will hurt them, and B, that it will not work. So the phase of determining if it works is critical. That will take at least another eight months or so. So when you've heard me say we would not have a vaccine that would even be ready to start to deploy for a year to a year and a half, that is the time frame. Now, anyone who thinks they're going to go more quickly than that, I believe will be cutting corners that would be detrimental. What does that tell us? That tells us now, the next month, the next several months, we're going to have to rely on public health measures to contain this outbreak. The timeline for therapy is a little bit different. The reason it is different is that you're giving this candidate therapy to someone who is already ill. So the idea of risks and how quickly you determine if and when it works is much more quickly than giving a lot of vaccine to normal people and determine if you protect them. There are a couple of candidates that are now already in clinical trial. Some of them in China and some of them right here in the United States, particularly in some of the trials that will be done in some of our clinical centers, including the University of Nebraska. It is likely that we will know if they work in the next several months. I'm hoping that we do get a positive signal. If we do, then we may, and I underline may, so that it doesn't get misinterpreted, have therapy that we could use. But that needs to be proven first. So in summary, the work that's being done at the NIH is involved both in the development of a vaccine in the long term and in the development, hopefully, of therapies in the shorter term.